Hello, my name is Travis Monk. This is one part of a series of videos involving cell biology. This video will provide an overview of different cell parts called organelles. Emphasis in this video will be on what these cell parts look like, some of the things that they do in the cell, and different types of cells that possess these parts. The picture on this slide shows an animal cell and many of the organelles that will be discussed in this video. The cell membrane is a fluid or flexible layer that's found on the outside of many types of cells. It is a phospholipid bilayer. That is, it's a type of lipid that's called a phospholipid that is two layers thick. Phospholipids contain two different regions, a hydrophilic head and a hydrophilic tail. I'll take the time to break those words down to help explain why this makes some sense. The term hydro refers to water. A hydroelectric power plant is powered by water. The term philic means loving. An audiophile is someone who loves high quality sound. The term phobic means fearing. People who have arachnophobia, for example, have a terrible fear of spiders. The cell membrane is arranged so that the hydrophilic or water-loving heads face towards the inside and the outside of the cell where there's lots of water, and the hydrophobic tails face in towards each other so that they don't come in contact with water. The cell membrane provides a tremendous number of important functions for the cell. One of the most important functions of the cell involves its selective permeability. Permeability means to pass through, and selective permeability means that some things can pass through and some things can't pass through the cell membrane. This selective permeability can allow the cell to obtain materials that they need while avoiding getting too much of some material that they don't want. While some materials can pass directly through the cell membrane itself, there are also gateways or doors of sorts that are provided by proteins that are found within the cell membrane. These proteins not only play an important role in the transportation of materials inside and outside of the cells, but they can also be used for cell communication. The graphic on this slide shows a number of different things. First, the structure of the cell membrane, made up of phospholipids, is exhibited here again. Second, the fluid nature of the cell membrane is provided here. The graphic is even referred to as the fluid mosaic model for cell membranes the scientific terminology used to describe its structure and movability. Finally, some different proteins providing different structures on the inside, outside, and transmitting through the cell membrane are shown here. As this slide described, these can be used for communication, transport, and many other functions. While all cells possess a cell membrane, only some cells possess a cell wall. The cell wall is another example of an organelle that's found on the outside of many types of cells such as plants, algae, most bacteria, and fungi. The cell membrane was described as a thin fluid layer. The cell wall, on the other hand, is typically much thicker and provides the cell with a lot of structure. As described earlier, many different types of cells possess cell walls, but those cell walls can be quite different. The plant cell to the right, for example, has an extraordinarily thick cell wall that's made up of cellulose. Some bacteria have a cell wall that's made up of a sugar and protein substance called peptidoglycan, and fungi possess a cell wall that contains chitin. These different classifications of organisms will be described later in the year. While not all cells are capable of movement, there are three common ways that some cells can move themselves around. The first way that cells can move around are through an organelle that are referred to as cilia. Cilia are short, hair-like projections that are exhibited on the left-hand side of the picture provided below. There are usually many of these short appendages that help an organism move about. The middle picture exhibits an amoeba's pseudopods. The term pseudo means fake or false, and the term pod refers to feet. When you stick those two terms together, you get a description of what pseudopods act as. Those are false feet. By contracting different parts within the cell, Amoeba are able to move around using these pseudopods. Finally, as exhibited in the picture to the right, some cells can move about using flagella. Unlike the short, hair-like cilia that were described earlier, flagella are longer, and thicker, and are more tail-like. Instead of having numerous cilia, cells usually only possess one flagella. There are a wide variety of organisms that employ all of these different strategies for movement. Another organelle that all organisms possess are called ribosomes. Ribosomes, to oversimplify, read the genetic code and produce proteins for the cell. This process will be described later in the year in a unit on genetics in a video entitled Translation. 
The picture on this slide shows a ribosome and its two major components. The two different components, called subunits, attach to the DNA strand, shown on the right-hand side. As this ribosome moves along the DNA strand, it codes for different amino acids that are then stuck together to form a protein. The protein that's being produced by this ribosome is exhibited in the red box on the top of this picture. The organelles from the previous slides could be found in pretty much any type of organisms, eukaryotes or prokaryotes. Eukaryotes, as we've talked about in an earlier slideshow, are much more complex and much larger than prokaryotes. And for this reason, they need many more complex organelles to carry out cell processes. These more complex organelles are referred to as membrane-bound organelles. These organelles are referred to as membrane-bound organelles for one simple reason. They all possess, as indicated here with the example organelle, which is a mitochondrion, a double membrane surrounding each organelle individually. This is the same sort of membrane that you find on the outside of the cell, a cell membrane that's a phospholipid bilayer. The first example of one of these membrane-bound organelles we'll be discussing is the endoplasmic reticulum, often abbreviated as the ER. There are two different types of endoplasmic reticulum that have some different functions, though both involve the transport of materials within the cell. The first type of ER is referred to as rough. It's called rough because it has ribosomes littering the surface, giving it a bumpy appearance. In the picture to the right, rough ER is exhibited. The yellow structure moving back and forth is the endoplasmic reticulum itself, and the red dots in the picture represent ribosomes. Since ribosomes make proteins and endoplasmic reticulum moves materials, the two work in conjunction quite well to produce and move proteins throughout the cell. Endoplasmic reticulum that lacks ribosomes is referred to as smooth endoplasmic reticulum. There are many different functions of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, but one of those is just to move materials within the cell. While the endoplasmic reticulum is primarily used for the movement of materials within the cell, the Golgi apparatus or Golgi body or or even just plain Golgi, they all refer to the same thing, is used for the packaging of materials to be sent outside of the cell. Materials are packaged in small, spherical, membrane-bound structures called vesicles. Once these vesicles are released, they can be shipped outside of the cell. There are many types of organelles that are different types of vesicles, and they will be described next. The picture on the right-hand side of this slide shows the Golgi apparatus in the center, with many vesicles leaving on the bottom side, being sent outside the cell. These vesicles can contain many different types of substances. Examples of materials that could be contained in these vesicles would be neurotransmitters, or chemical messengers that allow neurons, which are brain cells, to communicate with one another, or hormones, which are also used for cell communication. There are many different types of vesicles that carry out different functions for the cell. Vesicles expelled from the Golgi, as described on the previous slide, can move materials out of the cell. Vacuoles, on the other hand, are a type of vesicle that are found within cells that play a large role in storing water and other nutrients. Animal cells possess many small vacuoles. An example of one of these vacuoles is provided in green in the picture on the left. Plant cells, on the other hand, possess a specialized vacuole that's called a central vacuole that provides additional functions. In addition to storing water and storing nutrients, this large central vacuole increases the rigidity or structure of the cell. Plant cells will actually wilt when they are low in water because water from the central vacuole that normally provides pressure against the cell wall can no longer do so. The incredible size of one of these central vacuoles is exhibited in the picture to the right. All of the white space is part of the central vacuole. Lysosomes and peroxisomes are other types of vesicles that fill other roles for cells, though they are only typically found in heterotrophs, which are organisms that feed upon others for energy. Lysosomes and peroxisomes are vesicles that are filled with enzymes that break down all the cell's waste products before they are removed from the cell. The picture on the right exhibits the typical structure of a lysosome. This picture clearly shows a phospholipid bilayer, which you would expect to find around all membrane-bound organelles. Centrosomes are organelles that play an important role in cell division, the process by which one cell would become two. The picture on the right shows the process by which centrosomes pull materials towards different sides of the cell by the stringy structures that are labeled as microtubules. 
There are usually pairs of centrosome present in cells because this allows for materials to be pulled to two different sides of the cells in equal quantities. Each of the two new cells that are formed would end up with half of the material from the original cell, everything that that cell would need for its survival. The type of centrosome that's found in animal cells are called centrioles, a term that you might be a little bit more familiar with. Centrosomes will be discussed in more detail in a later unit entitled Cell Reproduction. The nucleus is a large membrane-bound organelle that almost all eukaryotes possess. The nucleus is usually very easy to identify underneath the microscope, so it can be very easily used to determine what type of cell that you're looking at, whether it's a prokaryote or a eukaryote. A nucleus and its parts are clearly shown in the picture to the right. The large purple sphere, everything really but the blue structure that we discussed earlier, the endoplasmic reticulum and the ribosomes that sit on it, is the nucleus itself. One of the primary functions of the nucleus is to store the cell's genetic material, DNA. Within that large purple sphere is a smaller purple sphere that's called the nucleolus. The nucleolus is a portion of the nucleus that makes ribosomes for the cell. The last part of the nucleus that's worth noting in this picture surrounds the nucleus itself and is called the nuclear envelope. Just like the cell membrane, the nuclear envelope is selectively permeable. What this means is that certain materials can move in and out of the nuclear envelope while others cannot. In addition to this selective permeability, the nuclear envelope also contains small holes called pores that allow specific materials that frequently need to get into and out of the nucleus the ability to do so with ease. Mitochondria are important organelles that are found in almost all eukaryotic cells. What mitochondria do is break down carbohydrates, or sugars, and provide energy in the cell through a process called cell respiration. The process of cellular respiration will be described in the next unit. Mitochondria, like the nucleus described earlier, contain some important structures. Some examples of these important structures are cristae, matrix, and the inner and outer membranes. Cristae are folds within the mitochondria that give them their distinct appearance. Matrix is the liquid substance that is found within mitochondria. While these parts are just mentioned in passing now, they will be described in more detail in later units. One interesting fact about mitochondria is that the organelles are believed to have once been bacterial cells that lived independently of eukaryotes. One piece of evidence for this, other than their size being similar to those bacterial cells that we'd find today, is that they possess their own DNA and their own ribosomes. Chloroplasts are organelles that are found within autotrophic eukaryotes, or organisms that can produce their own food, such as plants and algae. Chloroplasts are the site at which photosynthesis takes place in these organisms. There are actually a number of similarities between this organelle, chloroplasts, and the one that we just talked about, which are mitochondria. One similarity is that chloroplasts, like mitochondria, contain their own DNA and ribosomes, and they're believed to have been, at one time, bacterial cells that lived on their own. Second, there are some parts within chloroplasts that are worth mentioning. Thylakoids, as shown in the picture to the right, are stacked compartments. The stroma, also exhibited here, are fluids that surround the thylakoid in chloroplast, the equivalent of matrix in mitochondria. Third, chloroplasts will be discussed later in another unit on photosynthesis. Now that we've finished talking about organelles themselves, we'll talk about two final vocabulary terms, cytoplasm and cytosol. Both of these terms are similar in that they begin with the prefix cyto, which means cells, but there are some important distinctions. The cytosol is exhibited in the right-hand side of the picture found on this slide. As exhibited in blue, the cytosol is the semi-fluid stuff that surrounds all of the other cell parts within the cell membrane just like the matrix would surround structures in the mitochondria, and stroma would surround structures in chloroplast. The cytoplasm, on the other hand, would include all of the liquid stuff that surrounds cells, the cytosol, plus all of the organelles that are found in the cell, except for the nucleus. We have talked about a number of different organelles within this video, but this is by no means a conclusive list of every organelle out there. While there were a few functions of these organelles provided, this, too, is a gross oversimplification. All of these organelles have many other functions that were not listed. A biology major in most colleges requires at least one semester-long class in cell biology. 
Within that one semester, you can barely scratch the surface on all there is to cells. That is the end of this video, summarizing some of the most important cell parts and their functions. If you are interested in learning about any other topics involving cell biology or any other themes of biology, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you.